Thank you for joining us for this pre-recorded debate on the future of aviation. It's a complex topic with many threads, including rapidly changing technology, a change in regulation, consideration of the environment, and the safe integrated use of airspace between our current aircraft and the unmanned aircraft of the future. We hope that we inspire discussion and learning so that we can ensure a sustainable, safe future as our industry transitions over the next decade. Thank you to the industry experts who've joined this conversation. It's going to be led by our very own Francois LaSalle. So over to you, Francois. Uh, this is going to be a great conversation today. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, look, technology is moving quickly. And if you look back to 1965, Gordon Moore, who is the founder of Intel, observed that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years. Although the cost of computers is halved. Uh, and this became known as Moore's law. And it just shows you how quickly technology is accelerating. The future of aviation is here. It's upon us. Technology is moving so quickly. It's making, you know, what we traditionally thought as impossible or prohibitively expensive, now very achievable and possible. Shifting the dynamic of how we know and understand aviation is moving literally under our feet as we speak. How do we move and adapt to this shifting environment? COVID has accelerated the use of technology and businesses are looking to adapt to this new environment. The rapid movement of, uh, of uh, the search for carbon neutral and renewable energies has also meant we're having to adapt. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, and, and, it's, and, and, you know, we've got a, a great group of people with us. Therefore, it's my absolute privilege to host a roundtable discussion today on the future of aviation with some of the industry's leaders in this area. So today, we're going to be talking to Jim Viola, President and CEO of HAI, Matteo Ragazzi, who's the Chief Technology Officer for Leonardo Helicopters, Jeanette Eaton, Vice President, Commercial Strategy and Business Development for Sikorsky, David Solar, Head of VTOL for YASA, Mike Solo, Customer Solutions for Bell Helicopters, and Isabella Del Pozo, De Poza, check I got that correct, um, uh, VP of UTM at Airbus Helicopters. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Right. I tell you what, we've got some questions uh, around some of the stuff that uh, we've already previously talked about uh, in, the, in the past or the, in the recent past. And uh, I'm going to go through and ask you guys a question. Uh, we'll step through it. And then I've got one final question for you at the end of it as we wrap up. I'm going to go to Jim. For, my question to you, Jim, is you'd like to see the most recent advances uh, in technology affect the short to medium term of the industry. You, you, you know that. That's a challenge for you, and it's something you're trying to address because you know that's where it's going to save the most lives. Therefore, what technology do you see as having the largest potential for positively affecting helicopter safety? Well, well, thanks for that question, Francois. I, I, I'm glad to be part of this uh, distinguished group here, and, uh, and certainly when it gets into you know what can we do, uh, I think HAI uh, Helicopter Associates International is an advocate for flight data monitoring or FDM equipment. We think that the end state being that operators then can use that data obtained for the equipment to improve their safety in, in all their programs. Certainly, I think uh, you know the offshore industry has proven that these flight operations quality assurance or POQA, as some people call them, systems do work, and that modifying as far as modifying adverse behaviors, reducing hazardous trends, and providing comprehensive uh, cor corrective training, resulting in safer flights. And last year, uh, June, U.S. Transportation Safety Board recommended that helicopter manufacturers make installation of data, voice, and video recorders standard on all new turbine helicopters. I, I think with a few adjustments, such as the inclusion of piston aircraft and targeting the use of these devices to reduce the top three causes of fatal accidents will certainly help the industry. HI believes that the, uh, the NTSB proposal could bring measurable safety improvements to the helicopter industry. HAI agrees that the NTSB, with the NTSB, that the flight diving monitoring or the FDM, uh, and some of us talked about here as well with the, the HFDM, is an important tool that can be used to increase operational efficiency and identify hazards. Just that data collection and being able to compare or look at what's actually happening there after the fact. Actually, HAI, the association has partnered for many years with the FAA Rotorcraft Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing Program, otherwise called r for Rotorcraft, to bring these benefits of data collection and analysis to more operators. An example of that is the U.S. Helicopter Safety Team 
has recommended the use of flight data monitoring to monitor aircraft and engine performance to be able to detect, correct procedural noncompliance by flight crews and also preserve more data that is relative to the accident investigations. With that, the United States Helicopter Safety Team also identified FDM as a strategy, but it's a strategy to prevent the top three causes of fatal helicopter accidents, which are the loss of control in flight, the unintended instrument meteorological conditions, or IMC, and low altitude operations. So we agree that all helicopter operators should consider installing the FDM as it will provide them with tools to reduce accidents and improve overall industry safety. Besides promoting the FDM within industry, we also think that the addition of the FDM and other NTSB recommendations to an accreditation program of the type we're trying to work in which participating operators can apply to a higher level of of safety is what we call it. So over the years, FDM equipment has become less expensive, it's become lighter, it's become easier to operate, and, and placing this technology well within the reach of the average operator. So that said, you know, we're still having problems you know, getting people to, to move in that direction. And, and I actually wonder, you know, the good work that Heli Offshore Door has done to do that and the data now that you are sharing internally, you know, some of those lessons learned are best practice. We'd love to get out of Thanks for that. Yeah, Jim, you know, that's a good point. And, and look, we've got all the aliens of the call today, which is great. And we've got a, a regulator on the call as well. Um, you know, they're all looking at those advancements in technology. It's very affordable, in particular, on also the smaller um, uh, helicopters. And from the offshore community, you know, when FDM was first introduced, it was always, a, you know, a little skeptical. And, and, and the pilots were quite rightly. I mean, I come from the airline world. It was exactly the same there. Big brother's watching. I'm going to lose my job if I do, you know, if I make an innocent mistake. There's always that threat. And as a result of that, you ask the question, how did the offshore community transition from no flight data monitoring to flight data monitoring? Predominantly, it was driven by the customers, by the oil companies who, who, who recognized the advancement of safety. So, you know, there was a, there was a, a good draw there. Um, but once pilots started seeing the results, i.e., one, you could get tangible results out of it, two, it wasn't punitive. The information was handled securely. The information was treated, the data was treated uh, uh, properly uh, and only, only for the advancement of safety. Uh, did they, did the pilots start buying into it going, okay, well, no, I, 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 I subscribe to this. So I think we've got a long way to go still, but I think to your point, I mean, it's been, the technology has been there, uh, but it was really expensive to, to install it. Now it's very affordable. So now it's affordable, it should be on all aircraft. So we've got to get over that mindset. I don't know one of us is going to talk about mindsets in a minute. So yeah, thank you, thank you for that, Jim. That that's that's really um, that's really good. Um, I'm, I'm going to go to Matteo next at Leonardo Helicopters. Matteo, you said that technology allows us to find alternative solutions. The gap between operations and airworthiness is closing, um, and rapid advancements in technology means that you may not have much of a benchmark. You know, we don't have a lot to benchmark against because it's all quite new. So what does good look like? IE is good, good enough. Yeah, thanks for this. Uh, actually, this is the you're right to the point. Uh, we used to design uh, helicopters and in general, in aviation, you have airworthiness rules and ops rules. Uh, and uh, we accepted the idea there was a gap, okay. Um, engineers were doing something and operators were doing something else. Now we are way more focused on intended use of a, an aircraft, uh, all of us. And that drives uh, actually a big question on the uh, new technology that is actually available and drives inventiveness. For example, if you look at uh, the uh, idea of a hybrid hybridization of the propulsion system, but in more in general, the more electric hel helicopter uh, and aviation in general, that drives the possibility to have a more human centric design and actually help the crew in performing the tasks, uh, even when things go wrong, actually. So there, there are inherently a, a serious, uh, actually, uh, weapon in the hands of uh, the crews and designers to make things uh, change. Uh, clearly, this changing, uh, this changes a little bit uh, the, 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 the paradigm. Uh, you challenge the awareness rules, these are changing. You challenge the ops rules, because now you have uh, a vehicle can, that can do things that you were not thinking about when you were designing things some years ago. And this is actually why you can, you can actually change things uh, in a positive twist, because uh, 
you can actually uh, design it with an idea of making it something that uh, is going to do the job in a more clever way. Training is going to be easier. Uh, the aircraft is actually uh, easier to handle. And uh, so it's not just performance what we have in mind at the moment. Uh, it's, it is actually safety in the way we design things. Thanks, thanks, Matteo. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you raised some really good points there um, in, in that in that area. And um, I, I mean, I come back to the original thing that I was talking about in terms of how do we, you know, if things are moving so quickly, how do we benchmark ourselves against that? That's that's going to be a continual challenge because we don't have the ability to benchmark against something completely new. Um, and exactly, so it's going to be incremental change. Um, but also, you know, I come back to the whole mindset thing. It's getting people used to um, the shifting technology. Um, it's getting people used to uh, the, the, I mean, potentially autonomy, right? I, I know we've probably got Jeanette who may talk to that in a minute. So, um, yeah, fa fascinating conversation. Um, does anybody want to add to, to what Mateo said before I go on to the next question? All right, I'll, I'm going to move straight into Jeanette, a uh, question for, uh, for you. And, and I know that you are also doing a lot of development uh, in certain areas, certainly around next generation. Uh, you get some timelines around some of that stuff, but, but certainly around autonomy or as you call it, POV as well, that transition. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? What, what are we looking at now? What is Sikorsky considering now around this area? Um, hi, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, absolutely. We have, we actually have um, two capabilities that we're looking through. We see that our customers are looking to augment their existing capabilities through unmanned systems or OPV, as well as electric propulsion. So the area I wanted to focus on is the autonomy OPV or optionally piloted vehicle or what Sikorsky refers to as our matrix technology. And today, we're actually already flying an optionally piloted S-76, an optionally piloted Blackhawk. And the idea is you have a setting that allows you to fly at either zero pilot, one pilot, or two pilots. And we, believe it or not, with Ericsson on the Sky Crane, we're, developed, we're investing in the Matrix technology and the Sky Crane for safe nighttime firefighting. And so you think about how old is the sky crane and what does that have to do with offshore oil? Well, the idea for today is not to have a pilotless aircraft, but the algorithms and the sensor technology such as LIDAR that's available, it can see things at a distance that the human eye just can't detect. It can react faster and safer than a human response. It's bringing a whole new level to 60-year-old technology. And um, if you look at, say, the F-35 program, those same algorithms, that's allowing the pilot to have a 360-degree view and can actually see through the airframe. It's amazing. But again, the concept is that technology becomes your co-pilot. Because I, I think if we look at, at this, the industry is not ready. In this particular industry is ready for autonomy. But I can tell you, Sikorsky currently has commercial programs that are ongoing in other market segments, and the OPD aircraft are here, and the commercial aircraft that will be flying in that bay in airspace, it's here and it's happening. Yeah, and it, it's, uh, it's interesting because one of the things that, uh, you know, we, we look at in Aero Shore is flight path management under operational effectiveness. It's a it's um, an area where we know that 51% 51 of fatal accidents in our industry are through to loss of control and control flight into terrain or surface. And that's something we're directly trying to address with a set of initiatives. And what you're talking about certainly in POV is putting that second or third pilot into the cockpit, that, that set of LIDAR eyes, for, want, for a better word, that can kind of give a high degree of support uh, I think you're right. I think uh, the transition from zero, from two pilots to one to zero is going to be a journey. Um, it reminds me of the, the Dockland Railways in London when they first installed them. Uh, it was a complete autonomous train and not one passenger would step on it. They were terrified. They wanted a driver and an inst uh, a conductor. And so what, uh, what uh, they did was they put a, a driver and a conductor on to to make the passengers feel comfortable the fact that they had no control over anything was neither here nor there right it just 
literally made people feel relaxed about the fact that the technology is good enough. And after a couple of years, they removed them and, and people travel it regularly today. Well, it's okay on a train in, in the air is a little bit different, right? It's less forgiving. So we recognize there's, there's a journey, but the technology is there. I mean, if you look at, um, uh, you know, uh, urban air mobility is a good example of that, putting passengers in the back of a, a, an air taxi and moving them around a city. I mean, we're getting closer and closer to that. And the advances of technology are really facilitating that the, 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 the ability to do that. So um, it, it's good. It's good that uh, you guys are, are thinking like that. But we've got to bring the we've got to bring the industry with us. You know, these these pilots and these passengers, they, they've got to be part of that journey uh, and accepting it. I guess we've got a we've got a little way to go. But still, it's very, very interesting. Um, I would comment our, our goal is, of course, is to eliminate CFIT. And through this matrix technology, it will provide you input. It's almost like if you think a stick shaker, it's going to say, hey, you've got an obstacle coming up or you have this issue coming up. And as the pilot, I can reject it or I can continue on the, you know, I continue on the flight or I can follow the algorithm that the aircraft's going to tell me to do. So that's exactly the intent to do it. And um, I, you know, I had a similar experience. I was out in Sarasota and there was a, a pod, a human pod to move people around the city. And there happened to be a gentleman in there and I asked him, um, you know, what his goal was, his mission was, you know, who's driving this thing? He goes, well, no one is. I'm just here to make people feel more comfortable. So exactly <laughs> your point of the train, it's happening now. Yeah, and I think, you know, this is part of this conversation. It's trying to let our community know that Times are changing, right? We, we, we've got to adapt and we've got to move. And for various reasons. I mean, our, 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 our uh, single focus is obviously saving lives and safety from a hello short standpoint, but, but it also brings advancements in efficiency. And, um, you know, everything's getting a lot tighter and a lot leaner, and um, we need to be uh, clever about how we manage these things. So, fantastic. Thank you, Jeanette, for sharing that with us. Right, I'm going to go to uh, Mike at, at uh, Bell. Uh, Mike, Look, I, I know that when certainly when you and I started to, to learn to fly um, uh, aircraft, we I was learning off Decker back in the day. You were learning to navigate with Loran and had to use Loran. I mean, you know, I'm probably probably saying that. You know, folks on, on listening to this are going, what? "What? What? What was that?" You know, I have no idea what we're talking about. But you know, you've seen a lot of change in this industry over the years. What are the advances that? that you are seeing that you think will really affect safety in our industry or enhance safety in our industry? Yeah, I'm looking back from 53 years, of, a little over 53 years of experience in the industry. So I have seen a lot come and go. Um, I think it's already been mentioned, uh, FDM is one of the, the greatest things ever. When I was at Bristow with Bill Child's guidance, we installed FDM in the aircraft. We had a lot of aircraft, over hundred aircraft. We were having on an average of three accidents a year. When the FDM got fully installed, we had one accident in the next seven years. When you think of the lives that were saved in that and the damage that was mitigated, it's, it's an unbelievable success. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing we have, we're working on Bell right now, we're installing in our aircraft is predictive analysis of hums. They're using predictive analytics. So we can tell not only that a component is failing, but when it is gonna fail completely. We can say that bearing that should last a thousand hours in a tail rotor drive shaft is going to fail in 135 hours. So you better be planning on changing it. You better get the parts and you better be starting to plan it early. So predictive analytics in HUMS is a great, great, I think, a great tool in our toolbox. Um, but, you know, all the things, um, the aircraft are getting much, much safer. The aircraft itself mechanically, it's the pilots we really need to worry about. Um, and we're trying to make it easier for the pilots. In one of our new aircraft, if you, for some reason, lose both engines, fuel contamination or something, the aircraft sets up the auto rotation for you. Altitude permitting, it lowers the collective, it adjusts the nose angle for the best air for the, the environmental conditions, um, that takes care of the rudder control for you. So the pilot can sit there and watch the aircraft set up the auto rotation, look where he wants to land, and then guide the aircraft into a safe auto rotative conclusion. So, you know, we're trying to help the pilots, and I think that's taking that load off the pilots and, and using our great uh, electronics is good for it. And by the way, you know, we're flying helicopters on Mars now, which, you know, you talk about things I couldn't have predicted 50 years ago. 
And uh, kudos to Jim for temporarily renaming HAI from Helicopter Association International to Helicopter Association Interstellar. And that shows you something about the that shows you something about the progress we're making as an industry. Um, that just couldn't be better. Thanks, Mike. You know, the, the, the predictive hunts is, is obviously a, a good thing. I mean, it was that, that we're talking about that's been rolled out on the, you know, the five to five. Uh, I had a, I, I was very lucky to be uh, given a, a factory tour and had a look at the aircraft when they were being built down in Arlington. Uh, it's fascinating. The, the, the systems you've got, the, the, the thought that's gone into that, the, the predictive hunts, for example, the ability to give pilots warnings only when they need to get warnings, not unnecessary warnings, the stuff they can't deal with. Paul gets logged and sent back by, you know, SATCOM to, to base. I mean, there's fantastic technology uh, coming out there. And, 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 you know, you've got the equipment and the capability in that aircraft to talk to what uh, Jeanette was talking about in terms of POV, to transition to that, that autonomous point at some, at some stage. So it's there. It's coming. Um, you know, the uh, nice part is it's not, it's not generic just to Bell. I mean, as much as I, you know, as much as I love Bell, Eurocopter's doing it, Leonardo's doing it, Sikorsky's doing it. It's across the board. It can be installed in yes. all aircraft. So yes. it's a it's a, a really great program. Yeah, that f fantastic. Thank you. And and that, I think that's what I want people who are watching this to to, to know is that. I mean, I've, I've got all the OEMs on this call, right? This is all happening, right? This is not tucked away, but it's it's right here. It's coming soon. So how do we adjust that mindset to 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 embrace and adapt to it, I think is is, is got to be a key enabler. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, fascinating, Isabella. Let's come to you. Um, you know, I, I know like all the other OEMs, and we just talked about that. Mike touched on it. You're all working really hard on the you know development of future future technologies that will enhance um, safety. Um, and uh, you've been looking at predictive maintenance as an example, digitization of satellite communications and try to bring this all together seamlessly. I know that's a real challenge. But what do you see are the areas that, you know, you are focusing on where you can make the biggest enhancements to safety? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Thanks for, for this great panel. So just touching base with what Janice just said on OPVs and the need for autonomy, and what Mike actually just also mentioned about the technical challenge we all face and all OEMs are already there. So for us, autonomy is obviously one of the key drivers for the, for the future, and we cannot achieve autonomy if we don't go digital. I mean, digitalization is key. We need to gather data. We need to be able to analyze data. And here comes basically two topics that we are analyzing within Airbus helicopters, which is how to improve um, with digitalization, with data gathering, with analysis of data, our own system reliability, safety of the vehicles themselves, but also how can we help with digitalization, digital services, digital support to better accommodate, integrate the helicopter operations into the current and future airspace, knowing that we have actually new airspace cameras that will join us in our lower level airspace like the drones. So yes, we are happy very much focusing on digital twins, on, on predictability, sensorization of our vehicles to anticipate and, and actually predict maintenance needs to optimize not only system reliability, but actually also uh, fleet management, fleet of operations. And then on the other hand, we've been very much focusing on additional communication, navigation and surveillance capabilities that can help obviously the helicopter operations in areas where usually the communication, navigation, surveillance that we have uh, from the ground support does not really cover the needs of the helicopter community. And how can we, with satellite base capabilities, support those operations and provide the required digital services that um, can not only in the current operations that we know and, and we very much operate today, but actually and very much looking into those future operations where we are already seeing that we will go more towards autonomy and digital communication, digitalization, and again, the analysis of data, exchanging of data and securing the data is going to be key. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise a good point. I mean, how our show is, is, is our focus is to be as, as data-driven as possible, right? So we know really where to target our resources. We understand digitalization, machine learning. This is all here, it's on our doorstep. Um, and then, of course, you raise a really good point uh, about the fact that we've we've got to seamlessly put all this traffic together, 
right? It, it's got to fly in the same airspace together uh, safely. Um, and, and, and there's a, a fair amount of work and development going on there, as well as regulation, which, which is a nice segue to David from EASA. So let, let's come to you. But as a, as a regulator, um, you have the unenviable challenge of keeping up with uh, regulating these very rapid advancements in technology. And I've heard you say that we have 100 years of mindset to change. I couldn't agree more. What are you focusing on now that is going to prepare us for what's coming in 10, 10 or 20 years from now? Thank you, Francois, for, for uh, inviting and for the question. Actually, you're right. We, we, are, uh, we have a legacy of 100 years in aviation right now. And we are facing, in, since the last couple of years, I would say, or, or a bit before, a kind of a potential big bang that is coming with the digitalization the new entrants that are popping up around the EV toll, urban air mobility, that are some new kind of operations, um, but also new systems, new uh, developments that are uh, blurring the boundaries. And I just rebound of what was said uh, by Matteo before, airworthiness and ops cannot be segregated anymore. That's a big, big change in the mindset of people. Uh, I can give you a, a few examples, EFVS, or so enhanced flat vision systems, down to zero, zero. It has an impact on aerodromes. Uh, reduced crew, single pilots, this has an impact on the ops holes as a whole. Uh, EV tour, uh, for the first time, we've issued a special condition, which is actually basing the level of safety, targeting the level of safety, based on the operational uh, intent, commercial, not commercial, and so on. And uh, also uh, the challenges of digitalization is going beyond uh, maintenance on conditions based on sensors and algorithms. Uh, and the challenge is to give credit, you know, to get rid of the old maintenance manual. And so that the uh, maintenance is really tailored to what the operator is really doing. You are a business jet operator, you are flying 300 year, uh, uh, hours per year. Okay, it's uh, it's uh, really something that uh, your maintenance is is adapted to. That you are an airliner, you are flying 10,000 uh, flight hour a year. I'm kidding, but uh, then uh, you have obviously a different constraints. You are an offshore operator, you are a non-shore operator, you are a VIP operator in helicopters. It's really changing the game and the way your maintenance should be done. And all of that is very challenging. Uh, for us because it's a mixing words together that are not used to talk too much to each other, to work too much with each other. At the same time, the architecture of the aircraft themselves are changing. And what we see is that the new technologies that are coming up, more electrical, hybrid, um, not only have an impact on the propulsion system, uh, but also on the way uh, they are integrated. You have distributed propulsions, which is bringing, especially for the vertical lift world, a, a new set of uh, ideas where, for instance, we could really get rid of the single point of failure, you know, uh, even though the mechanical aspects are less and less prone to, to, to be the root cause of accident. But this mindset, which is there for the large aeroplanes in quite a while, could, could also bring a new way to design um, stuff. And lastly, we have the human interface. Uh, not only today for the short term, uh, uh, the, the cockpit is changing quite quickly, but the way of training them. We have now new tools that are popping up like virtual reality uh, simulator. And, and you may have seen that we have qualified last week the first virtual reality simulator uh, by an authority uh, on a helicopter. And this is part of the rotorcraft safety roadmap, by the way, enabling cheap but very representative simulation devices to the market. And the key to that is not to just build the simulator, it's to give the credit associated to that, so that the operators do have the incentive to invest. And that's really what, you know, uh, you can force the regulation or mandate stuff, but the key and the uh, points to move forward is the market enablers. If the people see the benefits in terms of cost or efficiency, they will invest and you have the safety benefit around. Uh, so that's really uh, the whole stuff. And, and then uh, obviously autonomy is, is a big deal. We have artificial intelligence. We have, uh, uh, if you look at our website, uh, published a roadmap on artificial intelligence. And, and very recently, uh, last two weeks, we've published the first guidelines uh, towards autonomy. And, and the, this one is uh, human assistance. And we know that human assistance is the first really safety enabler. When you are in the cockpit in a critical situation, we know that the stress on the pilot is reducing his ability by 90 to 80 percent. 
Yeah. Artificial intelligence, no stress. Uh, well, I would say a sound analysis of the situation using all the parameters much faster, by the way, proposing to the pilot options. And the best one to select is already, you know, in, in a pilot mindset, uh, probably going to save a lot of life at the end of the day. And it will go up to uh, full autonomy, full autonomy uh, being over, uh, you know, able to be uh, override by pilots or not. And that would be the last step. And this one is probably much longer uh, down the road, but that's coming and that's coming fast. And that was my last word. Our challenge is, uh, as a regulator is to uh, adapt very quickly to what's coming. We were used to have long lead time, stable configurations. Now everything is changing at the same time. The configuration is changing. The lead time is very short. And, and so uh, that's a real, real, um, challenges and we are ready to, I would say, uh, work with each other, the keys to work all together to make sure we, we are doing the right choices at the end of the day. David, thank you so much. I mean, you've raised quite a lot of good points there. I, we're running short on time, but I want to get back to my final question. But, you know, just takeaways from that, you know, it's challenging. The technology is challenging architecture and design, um, how we integrate autonomy, um, you know, how we change the mindset. You've raised a whole lot of things there, which are going to be a massive challenge for the regulatory bodies around the world, not just the ASA, but all of them, right? The FIA, I mean, Jim will agree to that, right? The FIA is got equally the same challenges and how we integrate all of this uh, seamlessly and keep up with the pace of technology and the business demands to, to make it safer, make it more efficient. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Guys, we're running out of time, so I want to get back to, the last, I want to, get back to my last question to all of you, um, which is, my, my body question is, in as few words as possible, can you let me know what we really need to be thinking and doing now to plan for the future of aviation safety. And I'm gonna, we ended with David, let's go back to David quickly in as few words as possible. What do we need to be doing now? Well, in a few words, I would say first, uh, change our regulations to be more performance-based, technology agnostic, that's really a key today, they are very prescriptive. Secondly, it's to work all together, ops, airworthiness, flight crew licensing, OEMs, everybody around the table to have a common understanding of where we want to go, and the stakeholders, also the operator at the end of the day. And last, it's to look outside aviation also, where great ideas are going fast. And, and you know, we, we used to be a bit blind in our world. Uh, the world is changing also very fast elsewhere, and, and we need to be uh, really aware of that and take the good ideas out of it. Yeah, and, and by the way, so you all know, I didn't pay him to say that. Although collaboration is now tagline, he said it as if I'd written it, but I didn't. I didn't prompt it to say it. So, David, thank you so much. Right, let's, Mike, your, your few words. Yeah, I think Bell, along with the other OEMs, we have to really be looking at transferring technology among our business units. We're making great things for the military. We need to incorporate those things in our civil, civil aircraft also. They're kind of expensive sometimes for the military, but we have ways to make them work. Autonomy, uh, crash resistance, all the things we're doing for the military, we need to be looking at incorporating those things in our civilian aircraft also. Perfect, thanks, Mike. Jim, to you. All right, well, I, I would say that uh, uh, VAST, Vertical Aviation Safety Team. It's a growth of the International Helicopter Safety Team and the International Helicopter Safety Foundation. And the three areas we talked about today, regulatory, technology, and safety promotion are the three areas that we're going to work on internationally. And it's all about that uh, collaboration, the harmonization, and having the same voice, the same message globally that, uh, that we're going to work on. And so doing things like this, where it's a safety continuation of uh, what we can do, is perfect. So thank you for having me here. Thank you, Jim. Perfect. Isabella. So I will basically just subscribe to collaboration. Collaboration is key. Collaboration with other industries that are in some topic more advanced than what we are, and we can take lessons learned and copy. And also collaboration, what we believe are the newcomers, new operations, because we can also take a fair share on potential new services that can help also existing helicopter operations to uh, move and fly safer and actually improve the current operations. Thank you, Isabella. And Matteo. I think uh, we don't have to wait. We need to prepare solutions. Uh, uh, solutions don't pop up, uh, you know, out of nothing. We need to work on them. The other bit is that we need to demonstrate the added value that we are bringing and not creating new problems, actually. 
Yeah, no, that's true. Absolutely true. Jeanette, and finally from you. Um, yeah, I have to agree with everyone uh, that has made comments here, you know, with uh, David and Isabella working all together to understand where we want to go. Um, Mike, with military technology, I think about what they're doing with 5G and the connectivity that that can bring to our industry is huge, and that will make, like, real-time comments practical. And then, but most importantly, I think it all comes from the education and for the industry to be able to influence and have the confidence in this technology. So getting that message out, showing it, demoing, um, I think education is to be accepted. Thank you, Janet. No. Perfectly said. Thank you very much for wrapping that up. Right. So, look, to summarize, I think what, what we've heard is one, there's a huge amount of work going on in the development of new technologies. Two, it's here, which is challenging our status quo, and we really need to be thinking about how we embrace it and how we adapt to it. And finally, you heard some of the things that we need to be thinking about and doing now to prepare for the future. And of course, I'll underline quite firmly collaboration, alignment and collaboration. So that's going to shift our future. A huge thank you to Jim, Isabella, Matteo, Jeanette, David, and Mike for joining me today and talking about this very important topic. Thank you guys for joining me.